And welcome to Speak for Yourself. <laughs> you see this tie, y'all? It's Marcus. Mar- excuse me, Marcellus. So, Riley, dog. Yes. You don't got to wear black anymore. You slim. Oh. You don't need to wear the slim and oh, really? look anymore, big So dog. I ain't got to tuck my shirt over my belly anymore at the pool? <laughs> you don't have to, big dog. Oh. You, you have made it. I made it. And made say it. what you said off mic before we even get into the show. You say <laughs> I what? black looks good on you. It, it looks good on me? Oh, you changed it. You said great before. Anyway, that's Emmanuel Acho. Uh, dog. Taking away his compliments. And let's head to Dallas, where there's a great site for all you Death Prescott fans. Quarterback posted a video throwing passes yesterday. Dak got his huge four-year extension, but he's coming off a season-ending ankle injury. Report says Dak is not expected to do much during the spring, but he is expected to be ready to go for training camp. So, Acho, should Dak feel pressure next season? Yes, sir. Um, Marcellus Wiley, I love this conversation. I love talking about Dak Prescott. We just started. How you love it? I love it because I love where this conversation will go. Sometimes you you just know. know I know you. No me. No Dak. You know where this conversation's going to go. Okay. I'm going to drop this bomb, this hammer on y'all, if I may. Ooh. Because in the NFL, you get paid off of production, but Dak Prescott got paid off of potential. Okay. So he I should look. absolutely feel pressure. Mm, I see, yes. Right? In I the NFL, yes. it's not like the NBA. NBA, man, I think this dude is going to ball. Okay. So I'm going to pay him based off of his potential. Yeah. But the NFL, that ain't it. Y'all, the NFL, the game we all love so much, mm. you get paid off of production. What have you done already? Uh, he Carson said the table, Wentz. y'all. He got paid not off potential. He got paid because his team went to a Super Bowl. He wasn't there, but his team went there. He led them there, and they eventually won. Jared Goff got paid off of production. His team went to a Super Bowl. He didn't necessarily win it, but his team went. Mm. Russell Wilson, Mm. he got paid off of production. Mm. Went to a Super Bowl, won a Super Bowl, went to a Super Bowl, didn't win. Mm. Historically, the great quarterbacks that get paid, they get paid off production. Okay, I'm listening. Not necessarily getting paid off of potential. Uh. Dak got paid off potential. Mm. So now there is pressure to produce. Oh, Because for everything Dak Prescott has done well, and boy, has he done some things well, that didn't merit $160 million. Being tied for the sixth best record in the NFL since he got into the league, that doesn't merit $160 million. Being one and two in the playoffs in his five-year NFL career, That doesn't merit $160 million. Having one of the greatest passer ratings in NFL history, the best passer rating in Cowboys history, that doesn't merit $160 million. But Dak Prescott's potential, boy, does that merit $160 million. Mm. Because if you can do something, yeah, Dak, I'll pay you that bread. Let's talk Jimmy G, your guy. Now you're trying to go to my heart. Conversation. Oh, Jimmy G, too. Let's talk some talk then. Jimmy G got paid off potential. Remember, he got paid after, I believe, seven career games as a starter. Seven and no, though. Say seven it right. and no. Say it right. No doubt about That's it. Let right. me say it with my check. <laughs> seven and no. He got paid off of potential. I get it. But mm. he ended up producing. Mm. The difference is Dak Prescott, you are more in the Jimmy G boat than the Russell Wilson boat. Because wow. Dak Prescott, they are paying you off of potential. And because they're paying you off of potential as opposed to production, mm. there is pressure to produce. Oh. <laughs> I came out the cage. You did! Damn, hammer and nails. You're a construction <laughs> worker over there building that house. My Here's dog. the frame. I'm going to change all the variables so you guys have to live in this house that I just newly constructed. Boy, you just try to warp reality to what Acho wants. I had to. Let me sit up here and do my job, <laughs> which is talk reality. Should Dak feel pressure next season? No, sir. I'll tell you why. One, we have to understand what pressure is. And sometimes we umbrella everything under what pressure is supposed to be. And that's not the case in this situation. I want to give you the contrast between pressure and anxiety. Mm. Different. Oh, God, I lived through this situation. You know I signed a DAC deal. Um, what was it, 2001? I was on Sports Illustrated. I don't know if I was the cover or just one of the feature articles. You know, I, I, I don't know. I was just flipping through. Maybe I was on the first page. Here's the point of it. I've been in this position before. You've been in this position before. The pressure before, but between that moment and then accomplishment, and then the anxiety that comes from after it. Talk to me. First of all, the pressure is in the pursuit Mm -hmm. of becoming something. Pressure is based on I'm trying to prove myself right to the world. I'm trying to be something to this world. Dak Prescott wants that contract. Dak Prescott wants to be the long-term answer at quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. Dak Prescott wants to be a franchise quarterback. Pressure to get to that. But he's checked those boxes now. So now in this moment is the anxiety. The anxiety is actually, oh, 
Since I've already had the pressure of proving myself right, let me prove that they were right in believing in me. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference, and I tell you this in personal example. My contract year in Buffalo, there was pressure to go get paid. There was pressure to live up to the billing of what Bruce Smith was and what he departed. There was pressure in that moment. But once I checked those boxes, went to San Diego with my money, there was just anxiety. And what are they based on? Consequences. Pressure is based on the consequences. Grave consequences. Hey, you don't ball, you don't get paid. Hey, you don't ball, maybe we got to look elsewhere at quarterback. That was pressure getting up to that mountaintop for Dak Prescott. He's already there. The anxiety is just trying to live up to what that is. But there are no consequences. Ain't nobody demoting Dak Prescott <laughs> this year. I don't give a damn how bad he plays. Ain't no Dak Prescott going to be in a situation where he wears another helmet next year, no matter how bad he plays, because the consequences aren't there. So until you show me consequences that are married to the pressure, then this is nothing but anxiety, my, my brother. Dog. My and dog. anxiety is self-inflicted. That's why I like this show. Because my dog come with some heat, and I'm not going to sit here and quench that heat that you came with. Mm. But I might have to take you back to Compton here in a second. Oh, we going home? So, we going? Uh, whenever you are overpaid and under-deliver in the <laughs> NFL, you know that's called stealing. Oh, 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 oh. When somebody hey, gets overpaid. Don't talk about stealing in Dallas and then look at me. Because I am guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. When somebody gets okay. overpaid yeah, and yeah. they underdeliver, fellas, mm. ladies, that's called stealing in the league. That's called stealing just about anywhere in anywhere. life. Anywhere, yeah, yeah. Now, Sal, so I don't know if you've ever stole anything in your life. Oh, yeah, I was a thief growing but up. But I have. Oh, okay. Sporting good store. I was about six years old. I wanted some goggles. I think there was a new swim class or something, a new pool in the neighborhood. I don't recall. <laughs> I don't recall. I don't recall. But I remember I stole some goggles from a sports store. That's the difference good. is... I didn't necessarily steal it. My parents walked out with it. They didn't know. We bought a basketball. Now, they paid for the basketball. But y'all remember at the sporting goods stores, the basketball comes in a case. Yeah. A little square yeah, case yeah. On, the, on the two sides and then the ball on the other side. Yeah. So I put the goggles in the case of the basketball. My Damn. parents don't know. I'm sorry, Dr. Sonny and Cristiacho. I'm telling y'all now. So I put the goggles inside the ball. So my parents, they pay for the basketball willingly. Oh. And then they walk out not knowing that there are goggles inside the case. But as soon as we get into the car, I scrummage into the bag, I take the goggles. But Phil, whenever you steal, there's a pressure not to get caught. Okay. Because okay. I stole the goggles, mm -hmm. and now I'm like, uh-oh, mm -hmm. what happens if my parents see them? Mm -hmm. So I take the goggles, as soon as I get home, I feel guilty, I realize I stole something, I might get caught. Mm -hmm. I throw them over the neighbor's fence. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm, I'm good now. My dog good. If Dak Prescott is overpaid and he under-delivers, he has that pressure to not get caught of stealing. Ooh, who mm, got caught mm, stealing? Mm. Jared Goff got caught stealing by the Rams. Uh-oh. Oh, damn. We caught you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he got shipped over to Detroit. That didn't work. Carson Wentz, he got caught stealing by the Eagles. Mm. We caught you, mm. thief. Mm. Send him over to the Colts. Kirk Cousins, he ain't been caught yet, but you better believe he running. He running in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> he out there running. Is that Kirk? Is that Kirk Cousins over there? He's about to get caught stealing yes, from yes, the Vikings yes, yes. because he hasn't delivered oh, to what he got paid for. Dak Prescott is going to feel pressure sell because $160 million in the event mm. he underdelivers because we know he was paid handsomely. Okay. But in the event he underdelivers, they going to catch him stealing. Mm. Jimmy G just got caught. He mm. just got caught stealing. Mm. And you see what happened to him. I don't know about that last example. He got but, caught. Uh, hey, officer, that ain't him. <laughs> you, you arrested the wrong man, not Jimmy G. Arrest Kyle Shanahan. The second uh, okay. layer for me, okay. Seth, is yeah. there is pressure because in the event you end up being a thief, that is, you underdeliver based upon your pay, you will get caught. And there is pressure not to get caught by all quarterbacks who get compensated. Hands. Damn, that's a beautiful take right there. That thing look good. Look like me in this suit with this tie right now. I love it. All right, let's layer this. Um, I still disagree with you. First, let me go back to my first disagreement. When you talked about, oh, the guys who are getting paid and they already proved that they needed that money. Mm -hmm. Cam Newton wasn't that guy. Cam Newton got paid and then went 15-1 and one, and then went to the Super Bowl. Hmm. Deshaun Watson wasn't that guy. That's oh, fair. That's a good thing. Oh, oh really? That's fair, but Cam... I got more fair ones. If you want, you want a fair one, homeboy? <laughs> I throw you a fair one. The point is, I got a list, too, of dudes who didn't necessarily earn it, as you want to say, but now you want to call them a thief if they don't continue to earn it in Acho's eyes. Here's the problem. Um, other than you being a, a little klepto out there. <laughs> 
him and breaking and entering. It was once. Yeah, because I know that. Um, mm-hmm. I know that. I, <laughs> EGOT, EGOT, EGOT. <laughs> Whip that out of you. But here's the thing. Um, this situation, there's no catching Dak. Uh, you talk about Carson Wentz. You talk about Jared Goff. All those guys saw it coming. So in the situation of pressure, you can also see it coming because you know what the consequences are. But are there any consequences in this moment? Is there any consequences in 2021 if you're Dak Prescott? Absolutely not. Now, 2022, if you have one of the worst seasons ever at the quarterback position, like a couple guys you named, then they're going to be like, mm, what did they do to Carson Wentz? They didn't just arrest him. They didn't just say, hey, stop, thief. They said, oh, we're just going to have a little ankle, ankle bracelet on you right now. Mm, Name Jalen Hurts. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. But we're going to put them around you. And the Jared Goff situation, if you know it internally, they've been beefing all year because of all the turnovers for Jared Goff. So they always talk to you before they arrest you in this situation. But I, I go back to this line, man. There's pressure to go get it. Once you got it, there's no pressure there. There's a different feeling. There's a different emotion. But pressure comes with actionable consequences like I can't I can't feel pressure if there's nothing that's going to be in terms of a ramification that's negative what can you do so pressure to me is always like these outside forces trying to penetrate the inside yes sir but anxiety is the inside force that's trying to get out and so in this situation Dak you already made it you already got your money you're already the franchise quarterback only thing that can hurt you now is your confidence your self-esteem you're not playing well but what's the actionable consequences of that? It will materialize, but what can the Dallas Cowboys do if Dak lays the bed this year? Not that. Those situations you're talking about, they had something. They had a gun pointed to their head. They didn't show up. They were thieves, and they got convicted. Sell less talk smart, because that's what you've been doing. You bring out the best in me. <clears throat> ah. So what we all don't realize, because I just had to learn this, the reason that air is thinner at altitude Right? We always hear air is yeah, thinner altitude yeah, because yeah. of atmospheric pressure. Well, America, <laughs> if I can't enlighten you as I was previously enlightened, Ooh. so why is air thinner at altitude? Because the pressure inside your lungs is greater than the pressure outside in the atmosphere. Oh, smell that. So yeah. your internal pressure mm -hmm. is greater than the external pressure, which is why it's harder to breathe at altitude. Dak Prescott is about to feel a lot of internal pressure oh. at a minimum. Oh. And it's going to be harder oh. to breathe at altitude because now his money has climbed mm. to higher heights. This is beautiful. And the atmospheric pressure of the NFL is going to hit Jack internally. Why do I say that? Anytime, Sal, you are given something that other people question if you deserve, there's pressure. You think? I got this show. Speak for yourself. I'm sitting oh, in the Oh, we're going home. going home. To the Let's heart. Go home. Let's go. I got to speak for yourself. I'm sitting in this chair. Now, mind you, America, y'all already know this because most of y'all Twitter trolls remind me of this. <laughs> I only played four years in the league. My dog. Go to Wikipedia. Acho only got about 33 tackles. Mm. Go to Wikipedia. Acho didn't last very long mm. in the league. I was only on television prior to this show for four years. Mm. Do your research. Mm. Couple other networks, couple other mm. networks, and bam, I'm here. <laughs> People questioning whether or not Emmanuel Acho deserves to be where he is. Mm. Anytime people question whether or not you deserve what you have, you felt there's pressure. You felt I feel pressure in the seat. Okay. I did. Not because I wasn't good enough to be here. Not because I hadn't earned the right to be here. But I know it's a lot of questions. Hey, what Acho do to deserve this? He ain't got no gold jacket. Mm. He ain't got no two contracts like Marcellus. He ain't mm. been in the business as long as Marcellus. Mm. What'd he do to get this chair? There is pressure. You at home and your jobs. If you become the CEO of the company and other people are like, wait, you just got here, there is pressure because other people are questioning whether or not you deserve what you have. Right now, it's not a unanimous decision that Dak Prescott deserves $160 million. Ooh. It's not a unanimous decision whether or not Dak Prescott earned $160 million. Patrick Mahomes, he gave you a Super Bowl. He gave you a unanimous MVP. Joe Flacco, before he got paid and was the richest once upon a time, he gave you a Super Bowl. You got other cats that gave you Super Bowl. Mm. So it's not a unanimous decision. The jury was not conclusive deciding that Dak Prescott deserved everything he got. So people are looking like, wait a second, you ain't deserve this, Dak. Mm. And there's pressure there, at least in personal experience. If other people doubt what you've been given, there is pressure to let everybody know, no, I earned what I have been given. Interesting. I love it because it was personal. So I can't argue that. 
Learned a long time ago, don't argue anyone's feelings. You can't win because you didn't feel it. However, I will disagree with Talk your feelings, uh, or at least the assessment and conclusion of those same feelings, because I was in that same position, mm -hmm. but I was in that position a long time ago. You were four years retired Sorry. when you got your own show co-hosting with me, right? I was three years retired, and I didn't have a gold jacket. Matter of fact, my last couple years, I had no sex. Matter of fact, everybody knew that I came from a small school. But I was that dude. But the point is, they were like, mm, that's a little early because you leapfrog guys who have been in the game for decades. I get it, big dog. But there still wasn't pressure. Let me tell you what it was. The pressure was to be in a position where I could have my own show. Poor Sports Nation. You remember that show? And once I got it, guess what all I felt? Anxious to prove that y'all were right for giving me that. I didn't feel pressure because there were no consequences. It was my show. How did you feel pressure when you already know you got a show? You got a contract. Lowballed, but you got a contract. <laughs> you right here next to me, not making what you I make. The executives can watch this, Marcellus. <laughs> oh, they like, are. You know they Oh, they are? Oh, well, the people who cut my check <laughs> are watching you tell them I, how they cut I my check. I told you, your agent, you and your agent, let me come in next time. I, I know what they know. I know what they don't know. Let's go get it. Um, here's the point of it is. There's just pressure to get the deal, and you're just anxious to prove it once you get it. In this situation, if you're Dak Prescott, why would you listen to naysayers now when them naysayers been yelling at you from hello? From, from going back to college, when you were a fourth rounder, what were the naysayers then? When you were on the team and Tony Romo's there, and they're like, well, I don't know what you're going to do this year. Oh, actually, I know what you're going to do. You're going to go 13-3 as a rookie. So now the naysayers, they have cretins. Now the naysayers actually in chorus is something you're going to listen to. When all this time on your climb, they weren't your fuel. So why would you now use that as your octane? I look at this situation simply. If Dak stays within himself, and if Dak is Dak, he's not only going to prove he deserves this deal, but there won't even be any anxiety with it. Coming up, KD is back in the building, baby! We'll tell you what Durant's return means for the rest of the NBA. But first, the Niners are expected to pick Mac who? Mac Jones or Justin Fields. We'll tell you if they're making a mistake drafting Jimmy G's replacement. That's next on Speak to Yourself. And we get here. Welcome back. The 49ers are expected to pick a quarterback with their number three pick in the draft. So what does that mean for their current quarterback, Jimmy Garoppolo? Well, multiple reports have the <coughs> Niners drafting former Alabama quarterback Mike Jones, while Kyle Shanahan is expected to attend former Ohio State quarterback Justin Ooh. Fields' second pro day next week. So, Marcellus, yes. we got to talk about Georgia. Jimmy G, Q, there uh, you go. Will the 49ers be making a mistake drafting Jimmy G's replacement? Yep, absolutely. That will be a mistake. Um, not even a lateral move, a backwards move for this franchise who obviously needs to rebound from last year's mash unit, everyone injured and also not living up to expectations and supporting that Super Bowl appearance. So there's always a scapegoat. Damn it. There's always somebody that has to take the fall or at least put them out there on the edge to be prepared to take the fall. And guess who it is in the San Francisco 49ers organization? Jimmy GQ. <laughs> Good Lord, they picked the prettiest to go out there and do the ugly work, to go out there and take this fall for this team, for this organization. But I ask and I challenge on our show, Jimmy G, who made Kyle Shanahan as a head coach, is now going to be the scapegoat. But who is Kyle Shanahan? Who is Kyle Shanahan without that last name? Ooh, don't go there, Marcellus. Who is Kyle Shanahan without Jimmy G? Okay, let's go there, Marcellus. All right. Um, last time I checked, I saw Kyle Shanahan coach 30 games with Jimmy G. And he won 22. Damn, that's a good win percentage. What is it? Oh, 733. Okay. And then you're overall just a losing head coach. Even when Jimmy G tried to help you out, Coach Shanahan, you're still not good enough. You want to know why? Because Shanahan, in his first two years, won 10 games total, absolute, combined. And then Jimmy G comes in on that second year. They're one in 10, Acho. He's replacing your guy, my guy, Chip Kelly, that was two and 14. He's in the second year going one in 10, and then, 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 Flying in from Fox, Foxborough is Jimmy GQ to save the day and potentially save his job, certainly his reputation, Mr. Kyle Shanahan. And then all of a sudden in that third year, first year as a full-time starter, once Jimmy GQ is in the building, guess what they do? <laughs> they go to the Super Bowl with Jimmy GQ. His first season and only season as a full-time healthy starter is a Super Bowl appearance. 
But now he's the guy that's trade bait. But now he's the guy that's going to be replaced in the year by this runway draft pick of Mac, who? Mac Jones or Justin Fields. It's senseless and it's see-through. Kyle Shanahan, stop trying to buy yourself some time by drafting another quarterback that you need to groom when you just traded for a quarterback that took you to a Super Bowl. So to me, this is a lot of displaced aggression, mm. meaning I'm mad at the wrong things. Or this is a situation that simply is just classic deflection. Oh, I got issues. People don't really want to look at my losing overall coaching record. The fact that I really not that good without Jimmy G, but blame the same guy who saved me and Jimmy GQ. All this is making up no sense to me, and Jimmy GQ is going to be the scapegoat. Ah, you're not wrong. We're not wrong. Let's go. Let's go. You're not entirely right, <laughs> but you're not wrong. Okay. Um, the 49ers wouldn't be making a mistake drafting Jimmy G's replacement. So, I don't know how it was in Columbia, Texas, the latter years of my college career. What I would do, the first, the beginning of a semester, I would sign up for 30 classes. I would take a full day on Monday, a full day on Tuesday, and I would look at each and every syllabus. 30, 30 hours. 30, 30 hours. Oh, okay. Yeah, 30 hours. Yeah, 30 hours. Yeah, I like Texas. Right? Easy. Like 30, no, no, 30, 30 classes. 30 hours, excuse me, <laughs> okay, right? So yeah, I'm taking yeah. 30 hours, a full, a okay. full course schedule. Knowing good and well, I only got to take 12. But I'm signing up for 30 hours worth because I want to look at every syllabus. And I want to look at what syllabus are the easiest. I'm looking at how does this right. teacher grade because I want to figure out what classes am I going to drop. It's going to help me get a better grade point average. So the first thing I'm looking at in each and every syllabus after I'm signing up for the 30 hours, what teacher is giving the most amount of credit to attendance? Because mm. attendance, that's the easiest thing to get in a class. All you got to do is show up. This dude. That's the easiest thing I'm to get. Hey, I'm and listening. So here's the other kicker. At Texas, during the latter years of my career, um, you had a clicker. Because all you had to do is, your clicker, you could mark as your attendance. You mean go into the classroom, and hit then, the click, and then the you were and there. good. And then dip and set. you good. Are you out? You're Gucci? Yes, because attendance at every level is the easiest thing you got to do in getting the grade. I know you go. I don't want to hear the rest. Let's go. My turn. <laughs> Here you go. Go ahead. <laughs> he ain't in the class. Jimmy G. He ain't got a clicker. <laughs> he ain't got a clicker. Jimmy G don't go to class. Jimmy G ain't got no attendance score. Bro, Jimmy G has missed 25 out of 57 plausible games as a starter. He misses 44%. Mm. So, mm, I'm the easiest thing you got to do is show up. Uh. That's the easiest thing. I checked the syllabus. Oh, attendance is 15% of the grade. Oh, mm. I'm signing up for that class. In the NFL, attendance is 100% of your grade. Okay. Because if you don't show up, you can't take the test. Jimmy G, you miss 44% of the game, sir. So out of the 17-game season this upcoming year, based upon Jimmy G's statistical history, <laughs> he <laughs> only going to play nine of them. Oh, so, God. Marcellus, even if your guy, Jimmy GQ, plays... Nine of the games and wins all of them. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's assume Jimmy G has an MVP caliber season. He goes 9-0 in the nine games he plays. Mm. The 49ers still got to fend for themselves for eight games. I'm not signing up for that, sir. Draft a replacement because at least you know he is dependable. Draft a replacement because oh, huh. at least you hope he is available. Jimmy huh. G can't even get the first score in a class. I didn't ask him to pass the final exam. I didn't ask him to pass the midterm. I didn't ask him to, 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 to do the short answer questions perfectly. All I said was, Jimmy G, please show up. And he only shows up 57% or 56% of the time. Wow. I, I, first of all, should have went to Texas. Sounds like, damn, you over there doing attendance? And you was like, all right, I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> and if you say syllabuses again, no, <laughs> syllabi, damn it, syllabi. I remember the first day I said syllabuses. Somebody was like, you got in? <laughs> yeah, I got into Columbia. What you mean? Syllabi, syllabi. Now, nah, here we go. Um, you bring up two words that I want to really focus in on, hone in on. Available and dependable. Mm -hmm. Good choice of words. Um, Kyle Shanahan's always available. Yeah, he's always there for the, uh, that losing record at 29 and 35. He's always there on the sidelines. Yeah, <laughs> Shanahan right there for all those opportunities. But is he dependable? Oh, is he dependable? Because he's coached 34 games without Jimmy G. He's only won seven. Okay, wait a minute. He's only won seven with every other quarterback that he touches. But you say he's a guru. You say he's a genius. But he's only won seven of the 34 games without Jimmy GQ. But Jimmy GQ is the one that needs to be replaced. Because let's not just talk about the draft situation, even though that's the question. This whole offseason. Correct. Maybe even before. 
I don't know about Jimmy G. Is he really running my office correctly? Because, you know, we would have really got over the hump. We probably would have won a Super Bowl if Jimmy G just makes that one play. One play. Mm -hmm. You want to blame it like that. Okay. It's funny you say that. Because when I look at Kyle Shanahan, this ain't your first time of losing a Super Bowl. Oh, oh, oh. There's a headline as it reads. Kyle Shanahan has now suffered through two of the most devastating Super Bowl collapses in NFL history. Is there a common denominator between those two? Wait a second, San Francisco, no, no, nah, nah. he was head coach, no, oh, no. Nah, nah. Oh, the name, Kyle Shanahan, it was right there under my nose. The same guy that found a way from a lack of good play calling, especially in the fourth quarter, to lose a Super Bowl as a coordinator, found a way as a head coach. But he's dependable to a coordinacho to do it once again with a different uniform, different team, and different title. What? You talk about Jimmy G and his availability, give you some of that, and dependability, give you none of that, versus somebody who's always going to be there and do nothing. Kyle Shanahan, 7 of 34, I need more out of you, coach. But what do I need more out of, Sal? What? I need something out of a guy. I'm going to bring this all to a head. Let's oh, bring it all to oh, a head. All right. Bring it up. Because I'm not going to disrespect Jimmy G. 22 and 8 is the start. I'm not going to disrespect him. Here's what I've realized. Yeah. You can win with Jimmy G, obviously, but you won't win because of Jimmy G. Don't, why? They, do you know what the 49ers were before Jimmy G? Five straight seasons. You can win no with Jimmy G. With Jimmy but G, you not a starter. you won't win because of Jimmy G. Oh. You can lose with a lot of dudes, right? I'm not going to say that losing is easy. You can lose with – they lost with Cap. They lost with Blaine Gabbard. <laughs> then this past year, they lost with Mullins. They lost with Beck, Bethard. You yeah. can lose with a yeah. ton of people. Okay. So I'm, say, I'm acknowledging you can win with Jimmy G, but you're not going to win because of Jimmy G. How you why, do I, why do I say that? Y'all yeah. got the play. We about to run the play. First game of the season. Go no further than the first game of this year. Oh, Kyle that. Shanahan schemes up against first-round pick, linebacker for the Cardinals, rookie. Kyle Shanahan says, wait, I have a 4-2 running running back against a rookie linebacker. So I'm going to run a quick little angle route because he's a rookie. Seven-yard pass. Marcel, this is a seven-yard pass. That ain't far. But in a box score, it goes down as a 75-yard touchdown. Why? Not because of your guy, Jimmy GQ. Because Kyle Shanahan says, I am smart enough to out-scheme a defense. You can win with Jimmy G. But as that play just demonstrated, and I have a plethora of plays to pull from, go no further than 2019 Niners against the Saints in New Orleans. <laughs> you will not win because of him but you can win with them. If you're Shanahan, get a replacement, somebody I can win because of and win with. Oh, God, that's so messed up. That's such a warped sense of reality. Oh, God, you use a specific generalization, which is one of the things I hate the most in this world. We use one incident and say, see, this is how it is. Wait, no, maybe just the first play. <laughs> Let's go further. You don't want me to go to the Super Bowl. You don't want me to go. You can go there. You don't want to go to the Super Bowl with Kyle Shanahan either. You, we could go there. You really want to go there? Okay, I didn't think so. Okay, let's talk about this situation, because I hate doing a specific generalization, especially to, die, to doom someone. Jimmy G is a quarterback. Kyle Shanahan is a head coach. Mm -hmm. Go. Who's better? <laughs> it got quiet. You know why? Because whatever you want to say about Jimmy GQ, what, his record's better. He's done way more than Kyle Shanahan has done as a head coach. But for some reason... Kyle Shanahan already comes in with the equity, already comes in with the billing as a genius, and then comes into a situation and is a loser. Like, really a loser. I'm not talking about the person. I'm talking about the performer. I'm talking about what he has done in record. It's way worse than Jimmy G. Why is Jimmy G going to be the one that you say, he's the issue that's holding us back? Maybe it could be you. It's just because you have power. And admit it, when we played, there was nothing worse than taking a fall or taking a back seat to a coach that you didn't think was better than you in terms of what you were as a player. At least I felt that uh, several times. You're like, dog, what are you talking about? You keep saying what I can't do. Can we start to highlight what you're not doing fully and optimally to give us a situation to go out there and win? Got anything for that? The only thing I have for that is this. Is Jimmy G a top 10 QB in your mind? It's Coach Shanahan a top 10 quarterback. Well, if Jimmy G is not a top 10 quarterback, then here's what you're doing as the 49ers. You are trusting that the number three overall pick mm. will be able to work his way into being a top 10 QB. Yep. Jimmy G is, what, 29, 30? I think he's roughly pushing the 30-year-old region. I think Jimmy G is somewhere between 12 and 15 as a quarterback ranking. I think that is fair. I think that is unfair because I think he's fourth in win percentage since 1970. I think he's fourth <laughs> best win percentage since he's been in the league. So I don't know. Is it a win-loss league? Is it still result-based? Or is it now highlight? Well, here's you. what we have to do, though. We have to count no-shows as losses. 
Ooh. You got to count. If you're yeah. counting no-shows as losses, mm. then Jimmy G is really uh, 22 and 57 <laughs> minus 22. He's 22 and 35. Yeah, so yeah. if you count no-shows yeah, as yeah, losses, yeah. Jimmy G ain't 22 and 8. Okay. He's 22 and 35, sir. But admit it. I'd rather know you ain't going to be there than for you to be there and just be a shell That's of it. who you are. Kyle <laughs> Shanahan. I, I see the uniform. I see the coach. I see the whistle. I don't know about the results there, coach. <laughs> Coming up, KD came back in a big way last night. He'll tell you what his return means for the rest of the NBA. That's next on Speak for Yourself. For the first time ever, it's a WrestleMania edition of SmackDown. Tomorrow at 8 Eastern, 7 Central, only on Fox and the Fox Sports app. Welcome back. It's time for a rewarding performance brought to you by Capital One. What's in your wallet? Kevin Durant did not disappoint his return last night after missing 23 games. KD came off the bench and was a perfect 5 for 5 from the field, finishing with 17 points in Brooklyn's blowout win against the Pelicans. Pelicans. Durant said after the game that he, quote, expected to come out here and play the way I play. <laughs> the Nets are now the number one seed in the East. Joined now by Fox NBA analyst Slick Rick the Buker, but Acho. What does KD's return mean for the rest of the NBA? Man, it means buckle up. Y'all in trouble. Mm. Um, I used to doubt these nets. To a degree, I still kind of do. But Slick Rick, I see the shock on your face. That same shock was on my face until I realized playing the Brooklyn Nets is like playing your older brother in video games, <laughs> right? Like, before you ever maximize the skill set of what all the buttons and all the triggers do, your older sibling already knows what it is. So you th sitting there fighting your little heart out, trying to press all the buttons and hit all the triggers, and your older siblings just casually whooping your tail mm. because they're just better. They're more skilled. They're more advanced than you are and that you may ever be. Mm. The Brooklyn Nets with Kevin Durant yesterday proved that they are more skilled and more advanced and better than I think all but two teams will be this year. Point blank, period. KD in 19 minutes. He went five for five. He gave you, what, 17 points on five shots. Mathematically, you start doing things, and you're like, is that even statistically possible? You got to start double-checking, check free throws and all that. Kevin Durant had seven boards, five assists, 19 minutes. Here's how I look at it. The only counterpoint is yeah. we haven't seen the big three play together. And that means something. That means something to me. But the fact of the matter is, even without the big three, they still win 75% of the games. That 75% of the games is the best record in the NBA. Without the big three, the Nets are 27 and nine. Without the big three, they still nice. So even with two of the big three, they better than just about everybody else. So do you even need to worry, oh, are the Nets gonna have the big three? Will the big three ever be able to mesh in jail? It's irrelevant because the big two, whichever two there are, KD, Kyrie, KD, Harden, Harden, Kyrie, all it takes is two for the Nets to get the job done. For me, everybody else needs to buckle up, except for my Lakers. <laughs> oh, stop. <laughs> Otto, your counterpoint should have been your point. You Ooh. got to something there. It mm. just took you a while to get there. That's how be. That's how uh, look, <laughs> it, it doesn't mean anything other than the other offensive stars in the league aren't probably going to get the same level of highlights that they did previously because KD's going to be eating those up. And in the short term, the opponents that the Nets are going to face over the next 10 days or so are not going to get a break with James Harden being out with his hamstring issue. But beyond that, until we see Kyrie, James, uh, uh, KD, Blake, and LaMarcus Aldridge, until we see the full package, we're really not going to know who they are. And I knew, I just knew, you were going to make way too much out of them boat, boat racing the New Orleans Pelicans, a team that is, uh, let me check, oh, 28th in defense. Would we have expected anything else? They were dead man walking. The, the, the Nets didn't prove anything last night. The Pelicans proved 
that they don't care whether Stan Van Gundy gets fired or not. <laughs> that was the proof of last night's but game. Slick, slick, Beyond that, I'm not taking anything more out of that. I, got, I expected I gotta, KD to roll. I got to ask you something, though, Slick, because, yes, the Pelicans' defensive efficiency is terrible. But last I checked, their offensive, effic offensive efficiency is eighth, if I am not mistaken. Last I checked, Zion yes. was one game away from breaking Shaquille O'Neal's record. They were tied most consecutive games, scoring at least 20 points while shooting 50% from the field. So the Pelicans' offense of efficiency is something to reckon with but slick i think the greater point to reckon with is this we all say mm. yeah we can't draw a conclusion until we see the big three i used to say that very same thing but what do you need to see the big three for if two is enough <laughs> if two weren't enough then i'd be with you but it appears that two is enough whether Harden and Kyrie, whether a KD and Kyrie, yeah. two's enough to get the job done. So we're still sitting here talking about, oh, well, they need those three to beat who? Yeah. I don't think they need the big three to beat much of anybody except the Lakers, except Marcellus' Clippers, and maybe the Sixers if they're firing on all cylinders. If we're talking regular season, you are correct. If we're talking postseason, when everything gets more physical, and defense becomes an element in this conversation and the efficiency of who's going to take shots when uh, and chemistry becomes an important element to it all, uh, endurance, uh, all of that, synchronicity, all of that comes together, then, then we're talking about a different equation. I, look, this is a very hard argument for me to make because I knew from the beginning that they were going to roll teams during the regular season because you just can't prepare for that offense. But when you get to the playoffs, you can. They remind me a lot of the Milwaukee Bucks the last few years and the Rockets from a few years ago where they would just roll over teams and they did it so easily. They were never in these possession by possession games where at the end of a game, they not only had to score, but they had to get stops. When you haven't had to do that, when you haven't proved that you're capable of doing that, there's going to be a question raised once you get to the postseason, because as we know, by and large, no matter how much you blow teams out during the regular season, when you get to the playoffs, you're going to have those last possession situations. And I dare say a team that's never been in them before is going to be at a disadvantage against teams that have. Look, I don't want to overthink this one. I'm glad Acho is now on my side. You know I'm a Clipper fan to the fullest. But when I saw this super team get... get put together. I saw these Avengers come together. I said, oh man, everybody, including us Clippers, are in trouble. It's just that simple. So one word comes to mind. What Clipper Lang say? Pain. Pain for the rest of the NBA because these dudes are not playing. It's literally a big three that we haven't even seen form just yet. And it's deadly already as just a dynamic duo. Going against other dynamic duels, the Clippers, obviously, Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, the Lakers, when healthy, LeBron James and AD. <laughs> and then what else? Because think about this big three. It's KD, it's Harden, and it's Kyrie, y'all. I don't think you understand what I'm talking about. So this year, averaging 81 points a game as a dynamic, uh, as a, a big three, no one's close. 13 points per game more than the next trio. And it's Lillard, McCullum, and Trent. Uh, that's not it, y'all. Let's go historically. Listen to this KD, Kyrie, and Harden big three versus other big threes and what they've done over the years. Tim Duncan, Manu Ginobili, and Tony Parker were killing it. Y'all remember that? Four finals appearances and four championships. Is that this? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to argue. LeBron, D-Wade, and Bosh. Insane, right? Four finals appearances, two championships. Is that this? Go State Wars, Clay, Steph, and KD. Maybe that's the closest in terms of talent level, all three of the guys. But still, is that this? This is a problem, y'all. We about to watch a versus. Like, yeah, versus being filmed. It's going to be Rob Bass versus Onyx. Because Rob Bass got, it takes two to make a thing go right. Right, it takes two. That's the Lakers and the Clippers out there trying to win. And then Onyx, y'all know sticky fingers? Uh, wait, it gets worse because they got another dude coming off that's just going to kill it. So these Avengers versus all these other dynamic duels, y'all know how this movie's going to end. Ugly for the rest of the league. I always know you guys are in trouble when you start making movie references. I, and that's for sure. Music? We're not going to go to the sports. We're going to go to some other fantasy magical place where defense <laughs> doesn't matter. I swear Marcellus must have gone into the digital room because I was going to bring back the full screen of oh, what teams rank defensively. 
that won championships. But apparently he went back in there and he burned it so that I couldn't pull it out. But let me tell it doesn't you, exist. The, Nets are, the Nets are still ranked 23rd defensively in defensive efficiency. No team has ever been ranked that low and won a championship. Not even the Los Angeles Lakers, who were the defending champions and had Kobe and Shaq, they were 22nd, and they did, had nothing to prove during that regular season. I've just, you guys keep talking about offense, and their offense is amazing. Defense still matters, and they have not demonstrated that they're capable of playing championship level defense. And during the regular season, it doesn't matter. We've seen Mike D'Antoni make a career out of having great offensive teams. What happens when they get to the postseason? It, we've seen it over and over again. We fall in love with the offense. I love their team, but until they demonstrate that they can get stops, that defensively they're going to be good. And I look around, it's like, okay, KD coming back. Is he going to make them better defensively? Nah. James Harden? Nah. Kyrie Irving? Nah. Blake Griffin? I, I think Blake Griffin's going to contribute. But he's not a rim protector. LaMarcus Aldridge, he's not a rim protector. So until you guys tell me how this team is going to improve defensively when, defensively when to this point they haven't, I'm going to say, you know what? I love the show, but I ain't buying any tickets just yet. Nah, Slick, mm. I, I'm, I'm actually with you just at the very end. Oh, you suck. I'm with you at the end. I'm with you for the fact of, it's yes, nice. everything you're saying matters, but it really doesn't matter until at best the Eastern Conference Finals or at best the NBA Championship like that's the, that's the only time it actually matters because realistically slick like the Nets are blowing past everybody Say even it. with their terrible defensive efficiency uh, up and through the semis up into round one uh, like they're blowing past everybody until they get to the NBA Finals or the Eastern Conference Finals so I'm with you come the last eight or last 14, depending on how long it takes to play out, the last eight to 14 games of the net season. But prior to those last eight to 14 games of the net season, I don't think anything that you're saying is relevant. Your relevancy comes in for the last eight to 14 games. But until then, I'm buying tickets to the show. Yeah, let's not confuse the fact that they are not playing great defense with the with the statement of they can't play great defense. Think about this. Right now, all they need yes, to do is... Yes, we can. Uh -oh. No, yes, we can. Marcellus, I'm not letting you get away with that. Okay. Like, no, no, no. They can Push play back. good defense uh, when they want uh, to. Uh, they just haven't the entire season. No, no, Based no. on what? Like, they Based don't have good defensive players. See, that's what's funny about you, Slick Rick. I'm going to tell you what happened. A lot of players, when you're out there, let's say you're pass rushing, okay? You want to keep, keep it in sports. You don't like my music. You don't like my movies. I get it. They not always... They don't no, I like them. I like them. I just, you know... <laughs> okay, now, now, here's the real... Since I don't use a move, don't mean I can't use that move. It don't mean I don't have that move in my tool belt. This is a situation where right now, this is a team with the best record in the East against teams over 500. They're good teams. This team has the best record in the East. So why go out there and expend yourself on both ends of the courts when you know that you don't even have to, like Acho said, until you get to the conference finals, maybe, but certainly the championship level. I'm not saying they're not working on defense. I'm saying that they're not going to use all of their energy up on that. You because got because, you because guess what? They don't even need it. They are plowing through these teams, not even with a, a big three. Not even if, always with a dynamic duel. Had, and certainly not with defense. If they had showed me at one point that they could play defense, if at some point along the way, or if they had a reputation, or like those Lakers who were the number one defense the year before, and I'd say, okay, I know they got that in their back pocket. You're talking about a team that's never demonstrated that they can play that way and they don't have the personnel that makes me say, you know what, when they need to get to it, they can. Who's First of all, when protection? have you seen them under the pressure of needing to do anything other than shoot the lights out? You have not. So don't go there and make the assumption that it's not in their tool belt. Last night I watched Utah play Phoenix, the two best teams in the NBA. That ain't it. And then you talk about the Lakers, if healthy. We don't even know. That's not it. And you talk about my Clippers. Okay, that's close. That's not it either. Where have you even seen it necessitated to see the defense? Let alone they plow through the whole Western Conference you know without KD. And now you're saying they need to show you defense to know it's in the back pocket? Marcellus, we got the Philadelphia 76ers coming up playing the Brooklyn Nets in the next week. Oh, that's we'll the answer. See right there. To me, mm. that's the team Philly? that's going to demonstrate defense matters. Well, Philly can't get even out of their own way. I mean, if they're healthy, we'll see what Philadelphia does. But right now, 
With the addition of Harden, since they got Harden, it's been a different team. And as we see, not even fully loaded and still killing everybody. Coming up, I'm mad at you, Slick, right now. Is Josh <laughs> Allen the best quarterback in the AFC? Not named Patrick Mahomes. I'll be back. We'll answer that next on oh, Speak for Yourself. We'll come up with a good movie one, I'm telling you. Got a little shiner over here from that one yesterday. <laughs> good luck. That might have been the best take I've ever heard from anybody. Not even just you, Acho. That was amazing. You're watching Speak for Yourself, Marcel Swally, with the amazing, amazing Emmanuel Acho. Let's go to my old stopping grounds where they can still feel me when I land. Buffalo. And Josh Allen is coming off a season where his Bills finished 13 and 3 and had their best record in 30 years. Patrick Mahomes is considered to be the gold standard of quarterbacks, especially in the AFC, but over in Buffalo. Allen finished second in MVP voting last season and is eligible for a big contract extension. So, Acho, is Josh Allen the best quarterback in the AFC? Not named Mahomes. Yes, he is. Who are the quarterbacks in the AFC in question? We're really talking about one man. That's one man. That's that dude, Lamar. Jack. Okay. Yeah, that's Respect that's, that's, on that's the name. only person that really can enter the conversation. Yeah. Just about Justin Herbert. He young. Chill out. Yeah, yeah. That's um, right. So that's it's right. really Josh Allen or Lamar Jackson. And what I think we all need to understand is that Lamar Jackson is an amazing player, one of the greatest, most talented players we've seen come across the league. He won a unanimous MVP. That he did. But Josh Allen last season was better than Lamar Jackson's unanimous MVP season, statistically. What do you mean? Racket? Full screen? Full screen? Zombie? Josh Allen's completion percentage last year was higher than Lamar's completion percentage unanimous MVP season. Josh Allen had more total yards last year than Lamar Jackson in his unanimous MVP season. Josh Allen had more total touchdowns last season than Lamar Jackson in his MVP season. Only where Lamar Jackson has Josh Allen beat is in interceptions, where he beats Josh Allen by having four fewer. So, literally, Josh Allen last year was a better quarterback than Lamar Jackson in Lamar Jackson's prime. By no means is this a knock on Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson is a dude. Mm. But I think we just have to remember, like, what Josh Allen did last year. The real reason, though, I would say that Josh Allen is probably the best quarterback in the AFC, not named Mahomes, is this. He can do it both ways, meaning he can give you the statuesque quarterback. Mm. He can sit there mm. in the pocket if he needs to. Dark, remember, dark. last year he was fifth in the NFL in passing yards. Or... He can be a runner if he needs to. Since he entered the league in 2018 at the quarterback position, he's second only to Lamar Jackson in rushing yards as a quarterback. Mm. So you slice it, you dice it how you want it, he's going to give it to you. Mm. You want a quarterback that's a runner? Josh Allen is top three. Lamar Jackson, Kyler, Josh Allen. Lamar Jackson, Cam, Josh Allen. Depending on what your flavor is, is a running type of quarterback. You want a quarterback that's a passer? Josh Allen is top five. Top five last year in passing yards, top five in passing touchdowns. Mm. For that reason, he is the second best quarterback in the AFC, not named Mahomes. Oh, man, I disagree with what you're saying right here. But it's true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm emotionally rooting. Lamar Jackson, I just love it. Um, kind of taking me back to high school when a girl would see somebody else with her same outfit on in school. It was like, mm. But she ain't wearing it like me. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? Like uh -huh. Lamar Jackson looking at Josh Allen numbers like, mm, a little better. <laughs> ain't doing it like I do it, right? That's how I feel about this. But, yeah, I got to give the nod to Josh Allen, my Buffalo brother from another. You know why? It's not so much about Josh Allen versus Lamar Jackson because I think that they're the same dude, just balanced differently. Okay. So I would say let's lean into who Josh Allen is as a passer more so than we do as Lamar Jackson as a passer. But I also will lean into Lamar Jackson more as a runner and his mobility than I would Josh Allen. So if you look at the balance of the scales, they're going to be in the same place, but different things highlighted. The real thing we're saying, what I really believe what we're saying is we trust the NFL's assistant of the year, Brian Dable, over Greg Roman. Uh-oh, evolution and growth in the passing game, especially in Baltimore, eh, seems a little stifled versus what we're seeing develop in Buffalo with Josh Allen. I remind people, year one with Josh Allen <laughs> wasn't that good. Ten touchdowns and 12 interceptions, not that full screen, right? Year two, all of a sudden, 10 and 6 record, and you saw 20 touchdowns, nine interceptions. Improvement, double in touchdowns. Then you talk about last year, 45 total touchdowns, drew 10 interceptions. Year three, 13 and 3 record. We see that growth. With Lamar Jackson, it's been this. Whoa. Uh, and that's not the same trajectory. So I look at a Greg Roman and say, unless you want to open it up, for Lamar Jackson, we won't see the full complexion of, jo of Lamar Jackson's game. So going forward, it's not an indictment on Lamar Jackson. It's just, yeah, guess what? I trust Stephon Diggs 
over Hollywood Brown. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I trust Cole Beasley over whoever you're going to say, Willie Sneed last year, or you want to say Sammy Watkins this year if he ain't in the cold tub. Point being, I just trust everything around Josh Allen more so than I do right now in Baltimore. Got to bring in Fox NFL analyst Bucky Brooks. So, Bucky, Josh Allen, the best quarterback in the AFC, not named Patrick Mahomes? Uh, I'm going to say this in Spanish. No. He's not. He's not. He's silly. He's not. He's not. He's not. I cannot believe y'all are sitting up here making this argument about Josh Allen and how great of a pass he is and how he exceeds Lamar Jackson when we only have one year of proof. One year. Mm. Two years his completion percentage have been in the 50. The 50 percentile. Mm. When we think about the standard being 65% in today's game, first two years he was in the 50 percentile. Last year he had a great year. Great year. Touchdowns, only 10 interceptions. But am I supposed to forget those first two years? Um, also, smirching an MVP winner, not a runner-up, not someone who was on the, pl- the, the, the podium who didn't get the gold medal, but we're talking about the silver medalist. Mm. And we're saying that, look, his silver medal means more than Lamar Jackson's gold medal. I'm not here for that. I'm also not here for the fact that you guys are talking about Josh Allen being the ultimate winner, the second best quarterback behind Pat Mahomes. Well, when I look at Pat Mahomes' career record of 38 and 8, do you know who's right behind him? Lamar Jackson. Josh Allen is 28 and 15. What are we talking about? His best year is on par, maybe with Lamar Jackson's best year, but Lamar Jackson's odd years still exceed what Josh Allen has done. To me, it's a moot point. It's a non-argument. It's Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson. Then we can have the conversation about Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, and the others. Mm. Bucky, you make a very good point. You really do. You genuinely do. I'm not upset at it. But Marcellus in shows past has made a better point. Cassell, you made an analogy one day about, I think it was the sacks you were getting. One year, you got like six well, no, no, no. Then you better start higher. You made a point about you can get <laughs> 10 sacks, then 8 sacks, and then 6 Yeah, I know the point. Sacks. I know the point. I lived it. Yeah, you want or, the point. You go, sell. You go, sell. You go. Yeah, you started off on my 6. That's why I was getting <laughs> cut. That's where they were like, it's a rat, right? Well, I didn't stop that. Um, I always talk about it's not just the amount. It's the order in which you get that amount. So zero sacks, five sacks, 10 sacks. People are like, oh, that's the dude. Versus a guy who got 10 sacks, five sacks, and zero sacks. But they the same do potentially, at least in production, they are 15, but mm-mm, it looks different. So Josh Allen's going to win in the court of public opinion, like he just won with Acho and myself, because we see it going continuously up. We see this for Lamar Jackson so far. And it's not on you, Lamar. It's on Greg Roman, big dog. Look, I, I can hear Giselle, Tom Brady's wife right now, saying, Lamar can't call the plays and throw the touchdowns. That's on Greg Roman to do something, do his part. And you're right, because Lamar Jackson is going to be in a situation where he's hindered. Look at the receiving core. We are now betting on Sammy Watkins to save the day. Not betting on his talent and the potential, because it's second to none. We're betting on him being available, and I just can't make that bet. I'm going to Vegas just staring at the dealer like, nah, I ain't got no chips for this one. I got to let Sammy Watkins prove it to me. You got to also make Greg Roman prove it to me. Been an offensive coordinator for eight years, top 10 in rushing every single year, and bottom 10 in passing every single year, including the unanimous MVP year. So, Bucky, all I'm saying is I get that the off years for Lamar Jackson are better than Josh Allen. But the on years, just Mm. slightly different. And then the projection years, oh, it's not a contest right now, unfortunately. It's not a contest because we're projecting that a guy played, I would say, look, because you're a math major, so one of these things doesn't look like the other. Mm. So when we think about this, the 69% completion rate that Josh Allen had last year doesn't look anything like those other years when he was in the 50 percentile. So is he more likely to repeat what Uh he did last year or to go back to who he has shown earlier in his career? The odds would say he's more likely to be that 50 percent completion percentage guy than the guy that almost completed 70 percent of his passes. Now, what I'm saying, Lamar Jackson and Josh Allen are right neck and neck. But if we have to talk about accomplishments, I would say Lamar Jackson's accomplishments gives him the win at the tail of the tape. 
He has been an MVP. He has been recognized as being the best player in the league. Josh Allen doesn't have that. So we can say, oh, next year will be the year that he overtakes it. But until we, he's done it, can we really say that he's going to do it? I'm more inclined to give Lamar Jackson the nod, even though Josh Allen's supporting cast will make it more likely that he can get closer to that than Lamar Jackson's crew. Here is, mm. Here's my issue, Bucky, with your logic. You're an incredibly brilliant man, but I found a small issue with your logic. Bucky, three years into Josh Allen's career, Two of his years have been relatively bad. And, but there's that one year, this past year, the most recent year, that was outstanding. Astronomically, statistically, it was great. And you're looking at his three-year sample size, and you're saying he's more likely to revert back to the first two years because uh -oh. two is greater than one. However, Bucky, if you were to look at, I don't know, call it a toddler who learns how to walk late. They don't really learn how to walk until they're two years of age. See, Bucky, <laughs> once you learn how to walk, you don't revert back to crawling, even though that three-year-old spent more time you crawling sure? than walking. Because mm -hmm. once you learn how to walk, Bucky Brooks, you just walk. And then you start to jog, and then you start to sprint. Josh Allen has learned how to walk, and honestly, he's learned how to sprint. And I think the point... Marcellus and I are both making, and it's not necessarily an opinion, it's just based off statistical evidence, them at their height of sprinting, Josh Allen has just run a hair faster. Not a ton, a hair. Remember, Lamar Jackson led the league in passing touchdowns a year. He was unanimous MVP with 36. Josh Allen threw 37 last year. Lamar Jackson had 4,300 total yards the year he was a unanimous MVP. Josh Allen had 4,900. So, Bucky, yes, they're both now sprinting, but Josh Allen's sprinting just a little, little bit yeah. faster. Yeah, yeah. If I could get a little more of this, a little ribs left. <laughs> I, I, okay, so he has one year where he exceeds Lamar Jackson, and we're banking on that one year over the two years who he's shown to be early in his career. Okay, I get that. So what we're saying is Josh Allen is an ascending player based on the example that you use with Marcellus and the sack rates and the numbers and all of those things. Okay, that's a, that's a fair argument. I can understand that when it comes to Josh Allen. I will say this, though. Josh Allen's best performances have also come when he has had more around him. Stephon Diggs was an absolute baller before he arrived in Buffalo. So now you add a number one receiver to the lineup. Oh, lo and behold, it's not a coincidence that Josh Allen plays better. My contention would be this. If Lamar Jackson has already reached those heights without a Stephon Diggs, in his camp, how much better would he be if they supplied him with a legitimate wide receiver? So if we're banking on production and what could be, I would say that there's more meat on the bone in Lamar Jackson's That's career I like and that. what he like could that? do based on that than based on what Josh Allen has done with a tried and true proven veteran on the perimeter. Man, we have a lot of competing interests and thoughts in this conversation right now. Um, Carson Wentz learned to walk, run, and then fell down, caught the yips, forgot how to do anything, move. So, Acho, I push back with Bucky's point of, like, be careful because it can go the other way as well, including that for Josh Allen. Um, what we're talking about also is uh, ascension, like, Josh Allen's ascension is clean. It's 10, 20, 45. Like, we see it, right? Versus uh, who touched the higher bar even in the roller coaster. So you're Bucky over here saying, well, look at Lamar Jackson, though. He's a unanimous MVP. But he still didn't touch the bar as high as Josh Allen did in his clean ascension. That 45 total touchdown year eclipses even Josh, uh, Lamar Jackson's MVP year. I got to get to this. It's simple as this, man. Uh, living through an adverse upbringing, you know, a lot of people want to tell me that I'm an exception. No, I just follow the rules to become an exception. But there are rules. And typically, one of the rules is the rich get richer. Success begets success. You want to know why? Because look at what's surrounding Josh Allen versus what's surrounding Lamar Jackson. Look at the neighborhood Lamar Jackson lives in with the Ravens versus Josh Allen. Brian Dabo, Greg Roman. Oh, God. Look at the school, the resources, the supporting cast. It's not the same, man. So everything is supporting, helping to cultivate what Josh Allen can do in terms of growth. Unfortunately, we don't see that same ripe soil over there when you talk about Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson is more of the rose that grew from the concrete. Coming up, Dak is back on a football field. 
and the Cowboys have big expectations, but we'll tell you if more pressure is on their quarterback or Mike McCarthy. Spicy time. That's next. Don't speak for yourself. The Cowboys are ready to hit the reset button after a disappointing 2020. Now, Dak Prescott had a season-ending in season-ending ankle injury. Say that five times fast. Say but the video <laughs> he posted <laughs> yesterday shows him throwing passes. Now, Dak signed a massive four-year extension, and a report says he's expected to be ready for training camp. That's great news for Mike McCarthy since the squad finished 6-10 and 10 in his first season Good in stuff. Dallas. Now, we got Bucky Brooks back with us, but Marcellus, how do you say season-ending ankle injury? Mm. Five times fast. Um, <laughs> who's under really more moving. pressure this season, oh. Dak or Mike McCarthy? I'm going to say Mike McCarthy. Um, surprised myself in this situation. Um, one, I have to just start off with this. Mike McCarthy, the distance between your highlights, your great moments as a coach, is starting to become even more distant. And that's the problem right here in this situation. Because this is a world of second chances. I get it. But no matter what people try and tell you and lie about second chances, two chances comes with two strikes. I'm going to say it again. Two chances, you're at the plate with two strikes before you even take the next swing. Because people don't really forgive and forget. Oh, they remember. And guess what happens? In this situation, if you're the Dallas Cowboys, you're Jerry Jones, you're Stephen Jones, you're sitting there, last year, forget about it. But let them mess up again this year. All of a sudden, it starts to add up. All those things you thought they forgot, receipts. They start to say, okay, wait a minute. We're sorry this year, 2021. We only won six games last year. Then the two years before he came here as a head coach, Losing seasons, didn't make the playoffs, and he had to take a coaching sabbatical just to get his mind right. Get his mind right. Get his coaching philosophy right. And these are the results. So be careful if you're Mike McCarthy because Dak Prescott just got paid. They hit that reset button when you get paid. Trust me, I know. So in the Mike McCarthy situation, if you don't hit the ground running this year and they go back to last year's receipts and then the two years, the last year's in Green Bay receipts, and then this mysterious coaching sabbatical is going to add up wrong for you, Mike McCarthy. Yeah, Sal, you said it in the A block, bro. You said that you didn't think Dak Prescott had a ton of pressure because what are his ramifications if he struggles this year? That's fair. And if I want to extend that point, Mike McCarthy, if you don't make the playoffs this year, you're likely fired. Ooh. And who knows if you will be a head coach again? Why are you likely fired? Because... Who are the quarterbacks in the NFC East? Daniel Jones, Jalen Hurts, question mark, or oh. Ryan Fitzpatrick? You oh. by far and away have the best quarterback in the NFC East. Mike McCarthy, you also may confirm the doubts that people already have about you. What are those doubts? Can you actually coach without Hall of Fame quarterbacks? Because uh -oh. remember, Mike McCarthy, your whole career, you done had Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers, two dudes that are in the Hall of Fame are going to be in the Hall of Fame when it's all said and done. You had two Hall of Fame elite caliber quarterbacks. But with Favre and Rodgers, you got a 64% winning percentage. Now, just with Aaron Rodgers, you still have a 64% winning percentage. But without them dudes, you only got a 37% winning percentage. People are starting mm. to wonder, mm. Mike McCarthy, can you really coach like that? Or did you just have some generational talents at the quarterback position? You got to win right here and now if you're Mike McCarthy, because if not, this is probably your last stop at a coaching stint because you will confirm the doubts people already have about you. McCarthy's under more pressure. Mm. Wow. Like, look at both of you guys being in cahoots. You guys have been around each other too long, taking the same take. <laughs> both guys going with the coach. I mean, I was initially prepared to go in here and say Mike McCarthy, but I feel like we're letting Dak Prescott skate without putting <laughs> any pressure on him. I mean, we just paid him $40 million. We just said and recognized by paying him that we're saying he's a top five quarterback. Now, I'm in Dak Prescott's camp and thinking that he is an elite player, but there's some pressure that comes along with that big check. Now, I know that check has already been direct deposited, yeah. and so you feel good, you sleep comfortably at night, but there's still something about that internal pressure to prove it to everybody because when he walks onto the field he knows it he walks onto the practice field everybody's like hey man Dak Prescott got that money Dak Prescott a 40 million dollar dude when that ball starts skipping on the ground people begin to wonder hey is Dak really that dude that ankle doesn't look right is he really capable of putting us on his back when we begin to add up some of the pieces that we may have to subtract because we have Dak making that money there tends to be a little more pressure on him. So, yes, Mike McCarthy is definitely under the gun. This guy has not won double-digit 
in, in terms of a season since 2016. And you are beginning to doubt if he can win without an elite or a Hall of Fame level quarterback. But there's definitely some pressure on Dak Prescott's shoulders to prove to people he is worth all of that $40 million that's coming his way this year. Yeah, I hear you, Bucky, zigging when we're zagging up here. And I can do the same thing as, as you can. But at the same time, in priority, it's Mike McCarthy because the, the consequences are just graver for him versus Dak Prescott. Uh, second chances don't start at square one. That's what I was saying in the earlier part of this discussion. Like, he's already on thin ice. Now, it's not a hot seat yet, but that hot seat can warm up this year and burn through that thin ice, and all of a sudden he's going to fall through and be gone. Think about it. His last three years as a coach, seven wins, four wins, six wins. Say what? Okay. Mm. Um, and, and then, mm. and then you, 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 you contrast that with Jason Garrett, who everyone's like not too high on, even though I like Jason Garrett. But his last four years with the Cowboys, they had the second most wins in the NFC behind the New Orleans Saints. Wait a minute. So we're, you, we're not used to winning at all of late, but we're used to winning a whole lot of games. And now we got this coach out here with seven wins, four wins, six wins, and who knows what he's going to have this year versus Dak Prescott. Now, Dak Prescott, the pressure is not once you get that money and everybody clowning you when you walk on the practice field. The pressure is to earn that direct deposit. The pressure is to get that check, not to how you're going to spend it. Like, Dak Prescott was in a position where, like, I got to go get mine. Now he got it. It's not the same type of pressure. But when you look at Mike McCarthy, the only thing I would caution even myself on is that Mike McCarthy was 6-10 before in Green Bay. Y'all remember that year? Mm-hmm. And two years later, he was a Super Bowl champion. And then the year after that, they were even better with a 15-1 and team that ran against that buzzsaw called the New York Football Giants that year. But the point being, he can climb himself out of this hole, but let's not even mistake that he's not in a hole right now. Fellas, I think it can be uh, deduced very succinctly by saying that Prescott has more units of measurement by which he can succeed. Mike McCarthy, the only way Mike McCarthy has a good mm. season is very simple. How many games did the Cowboys win? You win a lot of games, you succeeded. Oh, you don't gotcha. win a lot of games, you didn't succeed. Yes. But Dak Prescott, he got more units to succeed by what I mean. Cowboys started off 1-3 and three with Dak Prescott last year. They sucked, were atrocious <laughs> for what everybody say. Dak Prescott saw him pace to throw for 6,000 yards. Hey. Oh, my goodness. Did you see Dak? It wasn't Dak's fault. Even though against the Cleveland Browns when the Browns scored 49 points, Dak turned the ball over. Against the Atlanta Falcons when the Dak Cowboys had to come back and win, Dak turned the ball over. Against the Seattle Seahawks when the Cowboys had to come back just to lose, Dak turned the ball over. But still, we looked at the unit of measurement by which Dak could succeed. Let's go back to Dak's rookie season when Dak only threw for 3,000 yards and 23 touchdowns. But the Cowboys were 13-3. and three. Dak got an MVP vote. My goodness, Dak Prescott commanded this team to a 13-3 and three record. It don't matter. As long as the Cowboys do well, Dak succeeds. If the Cowboys don't do well but Dak balls, Dak succeeds. Mike McCarthy can win one way and one way only, the Cowboys record. Dak has more units of measurement to succeed. As a result, he better off than Mike McCarthy. Mm. Say it. Mm, I don't know about that. See, because at? here's what we do know. We know that Dak Prescott and his camp, they tend to be on Twitter. And sometimes they may see the clips of Emmanuel Acho going hot on Dak Prescott on Speak for Yourself. And he may not want to hear that umbrage because for so long, I think it was two years. You weren't part of that conversation for two years. But for two years, Dak Prescott couldn't get his money because he couldn't meet those metrics that you're talking about. Ooh. First it was, oh, he wins, but it's not because of him. Then it was, oh, our offense moves because of me. Yeah, but you don't win. So he is under pressure to now not only deliver the individual statistics, but now he got to deliver the dub. That is tough because this team still hasn't changed much. When you look at the free agent addition, they haven't added enough to say that this defense is going to be old. And then with Dak Prescott coming off of that ankle injury, we still don't know if he's going to be the Dak Prescott that we last saw that was carted out of the stadium. So the pressure is on him because with this money comes greater expectations. And those greater expectations not only include him balling out of control where we can see him in the same light of Patrick Mahomes, but he also has the ball out of control where we see the Cowboys in the same light of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers <laughs> and other tournament participants. Is that going to happen? I don't know, but the pressure's on Dak Prescott to make sure that it does happen. 
Nah, big dog. This is not about that. Nah, this is about trust issues. This has nothing to do with anything else, but who do you trust more? Do you trust a coach that hasn't had a winning season since 2016? Or do you trust a quarterback you just paid that has never had a losing season when he starts and finishes that same season healthy? And he's only been injured one season. So Dak Prescott always shows you if he's available, he's going to go out there and win ball games for you. It's, it's a trust issues conversation because... Now you're going to bet on Dak. Like, all of us up here say what we want. You're going to bet on Dak in terms of who do you trust more to go out there and do their thing. Mike McCarthy as a coach, Super Bowl head coach, is he going to do that again this year? Or is Dak going to ball out and we'll see where the Cowboys take all of those yards and touchdowns? When you have a shorter leash, I'm talking about them real short leashes. Bucky knows about it, being in L.A. longer than Nacho. Them Venice Beach pit bull leashes, like, hey, hey, when it, <laughs> hey, dog. Like, why do you even take the dog out if your leash that damn short and the dog that damn strong? <laughs> hey, 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 that's what it is with Mike McCarthy right now. Let Mike McCarthy go out there and let these Cowboys be 0-4. Dak probably going to have 500 yards a game, five touchdowns. They're going to lose by in the 40 somewhere. But guess who's going to take all of that criticism? All of that pressure. The guy that you kind of didn't trust in the first place, Mike McCarthy. Coming up, LeBron and AD are out right now. Yep. But we'll tell you if they can roll through the West, 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 when they get back. That's next on Speak for Yourself. Spit them out. Spit them out. Let's head back to the NBA. Lakers are four and five in their last nine games without LeBron and AD. They're currently the fifth seed. No mercy. Safe. Oh, he talking that talk. Slick Rick is back, but Acho, you convinced the Lakers will roll through the West. Aside, when LeBron and AD return? No question. I think when LeBron no and AD return, it'll kind of be like an avalanche. Y'all know how an avalanche continues to pick up snow and thus pick up steam as the longer it goes, the longer it rolls. That's what will happen with LeBron and AD. The longer they get back on the court, the longer they go, the longer they roll. Yes, they will pick up steam and roll through the West. It's been a while, but we got to remember, like, LeBron and AD went 4-1, 4-1, 4-1, 4-2 in route to a championship last year when you came back after a three- or five-month break, however long it was in the midst of COVID. So you get LeBron and AD back again this year in a, to certain degree, similar Western Conference. Not necessarily big-picture NBA, but similar Western Conference with the same superstars roughly residing on the same teams, then I expect to see a similar result. 4-1, 4-1, 4-1, 4-2. Like LeBron and AD, when they are together and when they are healthy, nobody stops them, nothing can stop them, mm. at least not in the Western Conference. Now, the Nets, that's another story, that's another conversation, but they will roll through the West when those two come back. Mm. Any surprise that uh, Kevin Durant makes his return and lo and behold, Le LeBron James jumps out on social media and goes, hey, 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 I'm, I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm coming. Hey, uh, look, <laughs> no, we keep making this false equivalence between what the Lakers did last year after the shutdown and what they're capable of doing when AD and LeBron come back from their personal shutdowns. Here's the problem everybody was shut down last year and everybody was starting from the same blocks. That's not the case here. And LeBron and AD are not starting in the same place. They're starting from injuries, not layoff. Uh, one of the most serious that LeBron James has ever suffered. And I have to be honest, guys, I, what's going on with Anthony Davis when this first happened and I know Marcellus has played doctor and let us know what a severe <laughs> thing tendinosis, tendinosis can be, but a calf strain and tendinosis, tendinosis I can't even say it, much less <laughs> explain it, is, uh, is taking two months. It was supposed to be conservative when he wasn't going to come back until after the All-Star break. Now, even now, when they're talking about him possibly coming back at the end of this road trip uh, when the team returns, uh, Frank Vogel still sounds iffy about that. And, oh, by the way, he's coming back without LeBron to face the Utah Jazz twice and the Dallas Mavericks twice. Good luck in changing the equation there. So when I look at it, uh, look, there, if, if, 
LeBron at this point comes back when he's expected to come back, which is uh, end of April, a week later than originally anticipated. That's going to leave eight games. And they're not going to be working from a position of strength. They're going to be working from potentially a play-in situation. So now LeBron comes back. Is he going to have to go full bore in those last eight games? Unlike the eight games in the bubble where they just coasted and went three and five? Or is he going to accept that they're going to be in a play-in game? Acho, I agree with you in that the longer it goes, the better they should get. But the problem is the avalanche may never start because they're going to have to come in very likely into a play-in game, and one game could decide whether they're in the playoffs at all. Ah, oh, man, I am torn on this one. I'm going to say no and yes. Damn right. Check better still cash, but I'm on the fence on this one. I say no because I think this year is going to be a worse version of the Los Angeles Lakers. And in life, when you show a worse version of yourself but get better results or as good of results, that's a slippery soap. And that's why I also want to say yes, because I think judged by the competition, they may get the same results, at least in the Western Conference, in terms of making their NBA Finals appearance. No, because <laughs> I'll take you back to college. Um, I only broke curfew one time, one time. And I remember that night why I broke curfew, and it was worth it, y'all. But I broke curfew, and then the next day I had a game. I was like, damn it, I'm going to be sorry. And no, I wasn't. And it was bad for my psyche because I went out there and balled out against Cornell, you know, top-ranked team in the country. I don't know what they were, BCS rankings. But the point is, <laughs> shut up. Um, uh, Sports Illustrated Player of the Week, me at an Ivy League school over people like I told them big ass schools I was the dude and inside no one knew I was like ooh, and it was scary because then I started playing with this mental formula of maybe I don't have to always play every game LeBron and AD and maybe I could load manage and can play around with it and not do everything the right way and still get optimal results that's tricky that's why I say no but then I say yes wake up it's the Lakers they're the champions look at the West I watched that Phoenix game versus Utah last night that ain't it Utah has not made the Western Conference since 06, 07. And Phoenix hasn't made the playoffs since 2010. So when the lights are brightest, I don't trust them just yet. Denver Nuggets lost to the Lakers last year, Western Conference Finals. Have they made up that gap? They look a little better, but I'm not sure. And my Clippers, we haven't even been in the Western Conference Finals ever. So yeah, I think the Lakers are still primed to roll through the West. But this version of the Lakers, I admit, will look a little messier than it did last year. What you got, Slit? Uh, well, uh, to me, the Lakers, and I'm surprised that Marcellus has not pointed this out, that the Lakers, to me, are the mirror or the, the opposite of the Brooklyn Nets. Defensively, they are still as tough as uh, yep. they're still, still ranked five. at the top. Yeah. Offensively, they are 23rd. And if you look at the last 20 years, teams that have ultimately won the championship uh, there's only a handful that were ranked outside of the top five uh, overall between offense and defense and the balance there. And the Lakers right now, if I'm not mistaken, are sitting seventh. The Brooklyn Nets are sitting eighth. And so that's another reason why I'm not, I'm not buying that the Lakers are the same team that they were last year. Otto over here arguing with me off, off camera, y'all. I'm going to let y'all know that. Um, look. This year, Lakers ain't going to have five months in the bubble and the Tesla Charger sitting there activating all those guys and getting themselves reset. It ain't happening this year that way. But just based on the competition in the West, I will admit it's different. I remind you, Slick Rick, because you love to bring up last year and that bubble and how the Lakers were ever able to respond to it. And every team had the same advantage. Yeah, so do you hear this? Yeah, I every, do. Every <laughs> team had the same chance. Nah, I'll give, you to, I'll give it to you like this, Acho. In track and field, there are better starters and there are also better finishers. Correct. So last year to me was like running 100 and telling Ben Johnson, just run the first 50, stop, go back to the blocks, run another 50, stop. He gonna win every one of those races. But they didn't have the war of attrition like you're supposed to have in every season, like you're gonna have this year, where Carl Lewis says the last 50 is when I'm strongest. Go Clippers, Carl Lewis style. We'll see how we finish this race. The Clippers into this conversation? It was a reach. Coming up, <laughs> the Bucks are the champs. But we'll tell you if the Packers or Rams are the biggest threat. That's next on Speak for Yourself. A bunch of meter in this. The Buccaneers must really love boat parades since they became the first team to return all 22 
of their Super Bowl starters since 1994. But they will have competition. The Packers have the reigning MVP in Aaron Rodgers and have been in back-to-back NFC Championship games. While in L.A., the Rams made a huge move trading for Matthew Stafford. So, Sal, who's the biggest threat to the Bucs in the NFC? Is it the Packers or the Rams? The Packers, duh. The Rams got a quarterback never even won a playoff game. How the hell are you going to bet on that? Oh, you are? No wonder you so bad in Vegas. I've heard stories about Acho in Vegas. It helps build casinos. That's all I heard. Oh, man, it's not even close if you want to compare them just to the Rams. I like the Rams roster. A lot of unknowns. But with the Packers, a lot of good knowns. Let's talk about this team. Tied with the Chiefs, with the best record last two seasons. Okay, that'll get you into the position to fight for a championship. Uh, let's talk about the Packers that led the league in points per game last year. Oh, yeah. One of two teams that had a top five receiver and running back. Oh, yeah. Got the league MVP. Oh, yeah. Look at me, all these stats. And one of four teams with a top 10 offense and defense balance, brother. But you want to just bet on the surging, I'm assuming, surging Rams with the unknown quarterback with the monstrous arm. I like all of that, but I'll go with proven results. Knocking at the door, knocking at the door. Maybe one day the door will open up because I saw it before. Teams that lost back-to-back conference championships all of a sudden crack through and get to the Super Bowl. Remember those 04 Philadelphia Eagles? They were in a conference championship every single damn year. 2014 New England Patriots, conference championships, conference championships. Then they go there, and they beat the Seahawks in the Super Bowl. So there's precedent for it as well, but I'm betting on the MVP and the balance squad. Yeah, big dog, you knew where I was going. Your boy going with these Rams, and because you talk about the Packers knocking on the door, they might be punching in the key code, but the problem is the more times you punch in the wrong key code, eventually you get... And access denied. <laughs> exactly. Oh. And I think the Packers, they might mm. just be locked out, and it's because they're doing it to themselves. The management has decided that they are content being good. And remember, good at times can be the enemy of great. So you bring up a great point, a point that many people home are probably thinking about. Matthew Stafford, he ain't never won a playoff game. He's going to bet on Mac, Matthew Stafford. He ain't never won a playoff game, let alone win a Super Bowl. Yeah. Jared Goff had literally never won a game. A game, not a playoff game, a game mm. before Sean McVay. Wins 11 games, goes to the Super Bowl. So if Jared Goff, who has never won a game, can go to a Super Bowl with Sean McVay, then Matthew Stafford, who just hasn't won a playoff game, Mm. I trust can make the climb as well. Give me the Rams because a limiting reactant for the Rams' success have been the quarterback position. Now you have one of the most talented quarterbacks in football. You got Aaron Donald, generational talent at the defense. Ain't no D tackle winning no Super Bowl. Jalen Ramsey, generational (laughs) talent at the cornerback. Ain't no cornerback just gonna be the And you got the coach quarterback combination that can rival the coach quarterback combination. Over there in Tampa, yeah. I got my money on the Rams. Okay, and you can add on it up. That's good. Coming up, good does Dak Prescott have the best wide receiver group in the game? We gonna answer that. My answer is gonna be yes. <laughs> Next, speak for yourself. Dak Prescott is expected to be back in the Cowboys huddle next season, and he will have a lot of weapons to choose from. Pro Football Focus says Dallas has the strongest wide receiver group in the NFL, with Amari Cooper, CeeDee Lamb, and Michael Gallup leading the way. So, Acho, does Dak have the best weapons in football? Man, he absolutely does, big dog. So you got you got three receivers that are thousand yard receivers. CeeDee Lamb went for 935 last year. Mm. Amari Cooper, he's had four thousand yard seasons, and Michael Gallup had a thousand yard season just a year ago. Plus, you have a running back in Ezekiel Elliott, who's supposed to be a top five running back, paid like a number one running back. So you got three thousand yard receivers plus a freakazoid running back. Yes, to me, that is greater than the two tandems in question, right? The Buccaneers, oh, you got you Mike go Evans, uh-huh. you got Godwin, and you uh-huh. got a question mark at running back. Fournette, Ronald Jones, whoever you like, whoever you slice it, however you slice it, however you dice it. Mm. You would say Gronkowski, but I don't know how we feel about like a 32-year-old Gronk going to be this year, throwing him into that conversation. Mm. Antonio Brown not currently on a roster. Or the Chiefs. But the Chiefs got Tyree Kill, Travis Kelsey again, question mark at running back. Clyde edwards helaire hurt often last year. Miko Hardman, young, can make some plays. But I don't think that combination is the same as the Cowboys combination. Cowboys combination, that trio was fourth last year in receiving yards, and they played the majority of the season without their starting quarterback in Dak Prescott. Uh. I think they do have the best weapons. And the only way they don't is if Dak underwhelmed. If we being real, like, Whoa. give Tom Brady them weapons for the Cowboys have, he would be lights out. Give Mahomes the weapon the Cowboys have, they would be lights out. So Dak Prescott, I think, will make these receivers even better than they would be anywhere else. And if they aren't, 
Mm. There's only one person to blame, and it would be Dak Prescott. No, you're wrong about that, and you're wrong with the blame as well. It's the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, I admit, there's a talent conversation to have. Who has the most talented? But the best weapons is not just about what you have. It's about how you use them okay. and what you're using them for. Uh, they haven't lived up fully to that talent level in terms of their receiving core consistently together. Obviously, because C.D. Lamb was a rookie. So we have to see him be consistent. We'll see what he does this year. He'll have the opportunity to show us what he is. But in terms of consistency, is Amari Cooper the most consistent wide receiver leading this charge? Uh, you could say, well, last year, no Dak Prescott. But it's still been a roller coaster ride in terms of Amari Cooper and consistent production at times. Certainly with Michael Gallup. Let's talk about that. How you went low, high. Well, I don't know about last year. It kind of went away. So they're still trying to figure out their formula. So when I hear the question says best weapons, I just think of a jammed gun in Dallas, whether it's, oh, Dak drops it. And then, uh, no, somebody else trying to pick it up. And then, you, then you're with backup quarterbacks. And y'all didn't have the right ammunition. Whatever you want to say about this collective, it's not the same as Tampa Bay. Think about Tampa Bay. They have better play players in their room. Why? Because when they had individual success, they didn't have team success. They said, we're still here as capable bodies, but let's go out there and win it all. And still have those 1,000-yard receivers on their roster. And who knows what's going to happen with A.B. going forward. You didn't want to bring up Ezekiel Elliott and his decline. I will. You didn't want to bring up the offensive line and them being 26th and 29th in pass and run blocking. You didn't want to bring up the defense that's going to contribute to the offense not having as many opportunities because that is a 31st rush defense, 28th scoring defense. You add it all up, it's going to have an impact on the wide receiver group, which it did last year. But so when we ask the best, I'm answering that question like independent of the conductor or independent of the driver. For example... So give like, them the same quarterback, same situation. Yeah, same situation, be. right? Because I feel you when you mm -hmm. say the Cowboys may be more talented, but they're not the better, right? Uh, the no, you say it. the Bucks are better. Okay. Because of what's the results and the production. And, and that's my point. And the Cowboys. And, my, and where I go is like, big dog, if we're talking about like what car is better, then we got to go independent of the driver. Okay. We're just talking about what car got the better features, what car can do more, what car has better torque, what car can go from zero to 60 faster. When I look at the Cowboys, bruh, Zeke, Amari, CD, Gallup, mm. to me, that's more than Evans, Godwin, question mark, and Gronk. Like, you, you're talking about four bona fide dudes to two and a half bona fide dudes, then Gronk, Evans, and then Godwin, like, hmm, hmm, keep going. What happened to O.J. Howard, your favorite player? <laughs> <Remember? laughs> you don't want to talk about that anymore. Um, all I know is, in terms of production, I have seen more consistent production out of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, in part because CeeDee Lamb is so young, in part because of some of the production roller coaster ride that we've seen, certainly with Michael Gallup, in part because of Zeke's decline. Like, you're giving me... If we went to the, the store, Big Five, and it was a jersey buy, yeah, I'm going to probably go get more of those Cowboys guys because of talent and name appeal. But if you want to talk about putting up the numbers and actually seeing the receipts and results, stay in Tampa Bay with me, big dog. Coming up, Antonio Brown is working out again with Lamar Jackson. Mm. Should he be a Raven or in Tampa? We'll answer that next. Speak for yourself. Antonio Brown posted videos working out with Lamar Jackson and his cousin Hollywood Brown yesterday. Mm. Now, this is deja vu from his offseason workouts last offseason that sparked Ravens rumors. AB has been linked in free agency to the Seahawks and a return to the Super Bowl. But so, Sal, yeah. where should AB play next season? Oh, man, he should play where he played last season. He should play where the getting is good in Tampa Bay with the Buccaneers once again. One, you know that they love you and how they will show their love. And A.B. started to show the love back week 15 through the playoffs. Oh, who was first in receiving touchdowns? A.B. started to hit his groove. So go back there, sign a short-term deal, one-year deal, Juju Smith-Schuster style, and line yourself up with that new TV money and get paid long-term going forward. Stay in Tampa. I feel you, Sal. It's one of two places. It's either Tampa, and I respect that option, or it's the Ravens, right? If I'm in a league at this point in A.B., you're for the most part a solidified Hall of Famer. The only reason you won't be first ballot is because of the off-the-field drama. So either go somewhere where you can play with fans and be featured as the number one receiver because you still have number one receiver talent or go somewhere where you can win a ring and that's in Tampa. In Tampa, you have very high chances of winning a ring so you can go back there, go back home, probably be the number two or the number three behind Godwin and uh, Evans or 
Oh, the Baltimore. Maybe win a ring, but you're rocking with your fans. Yeah, I like that, the Baltimore opportunity, because if he goes out there and gets them over the hump, bingo, with Lamar Jackson, and they can fix that passing game, something special there. That's it for us. Fox Bet Live is next, and enjoy this time. <laughs> 